So uh, some of this stuff has already been discussed, so I'll try not to repeat too much stuff. But my name is Dean Meek. Um, I'm a master's candidate at the University of Saskatchewan working under Bruce. And I'm going to discuss data mining and visual visualization of detrital zircon data. It's just a quick outline. I'll discuss the data I've collected. <coughs> then we'll look at provenance analysis visually, discuss alternative views of the data set, using multivariate statistics, and then a quick run through of cumulative probability. So just a quick note, uh, I originally started this project as compiling a minor data set to use with a larger part of my thesis, and since then it's grown dramatically. So I've extracted isotope, geochronology, stratigraphic, and spatial data from 42 different detrital zircon publications in North America. And I did this because nothing existed of this size at the time. As a result, I've compiled over 36,000 individual uranium-led detrital zircon grain analysis from 400 different samples and over 3,000 individual lutetium hafnium detrital zircon grain analysis from 91 different samples. So I've, you're likely all familiar with probability plots regarding detrital zircon. This is just a different way of looking at it that Bruce has already discussed. Essentially, we're looking at a top-down view. So we have deposition age on the y-axis, grain age on the x-axis, and high probability peaks are highlighted in red. So this allows me to look at all 400 samples at the same time. By doing this, we can recognize prominent grain age peaks on Laurentia. So I have these highlighted in colored boxes going from light yellow progressively to dark brown. And this is important moving forward because I will represent source areas or provenance areas using these colors. So light yellow for young grain ages and a dark brown for older grain ages. Just a quick look at the location of all the samples. There's pretty good coverage of the western and northern margins of Laurentia. So to use supplementary data sets with the detrital zircon data that I've compiled, I use date view that Bruce had already briefly discussed to extract geochron geochronological data. So I was able to extract more than 69,000 igneous, metamorphic, and cooling ages from around the globe as well as 7,500 neodymium isotopic analyses. Just quickly visualizing where all these points exist. These are the crystallization and metamorphic ages extending from 66 million years to 2,100 million years. We have a pretty good range. And <clears throat> also I should point out that moving forward, I'm going to use the same color scheme. So crystallization is represented in red. Metamorphism is represented in blue. I've also extracted cooling ages, pretty good global extent there. And this is by igneous data matching detrital zircon grain age peaks. Essentially, this is a map showing potential provenance source locations for all my samples moving forward. As I stated, young grain ages are represented in light yellow, and older grain ages are represented in a darker brown. Everything between a color ramp. I've also added the geological map of the Arctic. So in this form, we have many lithologies represented, which is fantastic. But for my purposes, I wanted to show a more simple form, as Bruce had already showed, the, uh, the depositional environments, which was available in the background attribute information. So using databases, I was able to query all the information, rearrange it, to display the sedimentary environments of this map instead. So I can use this to help determine or to ensure that my data collected for the detrital zircons are accurate. <clears throat> Finally, I used gplates as plate tectonic software to compile all my information on and then visually analyze provenance. So I'm going to start with an example at 1,000 million years. In the Neoproterozoic, Robert Rainbird has proposed a massive fluvial system flowing across Laurentia. So I figured I would show an example of how my data supports that theory. So I have one sample location at this age in the northwest corner of Laurentia. And I have a whole bunch of supplementary data. I've already explained the color symbology, so 
I have the Grenville orogeny right here. We can see there's quite a bit of metamorphism, crystallization, and this is also an area for potential sources for the sample found up here. So looking at all the data, I don't have anything obstructing this flow path, and these are the only plausible source locations for the sample. It seems reasonable that there was a flow path across Laurentia from the Grenville orogeny up to the final deposition point. Looking at 900 million years, still in the Neoproterozoic, we see a similar pattern. We see a whole bunch of source locations along the Grenville orogeny, some here as well, with two samples being deposited up there. So again, it seems entirely plausible that there's a flow path across, across Laurentia. And then finally, at 700 million years, again, very similar patterns where we have sources and then the deposition of the sample. It seems plausible that Robert Rainsbird, Rainbird's proposition of a neoproterozoic drainage system on Laurentia is accurate, looking at the data that I have. So a different way of looking at the Detroit Zircon data is inspecting specific grain age peaks. So rather than looking at a sample and trying to analyze where all of the grain ages come from at the same time, we can look at a specific grain age peak and try and figure out where those samples came from just for that grain age. Oh, and I should also mention that we can possibly identify <laughs> sediment recycling. So for the grain age that I had highlighted, it is 1,690 to 1,775 million years old. I've plotted all of the sample locations represented by crosses and then varying colors, as well as the potential zircon source locations. So for samples that are deposited at nearly the same time as the grain age peak, so those that are deposited between 1690 and 1740, it's possible to infer provenance for those samples. However, you cannot rule out sediment recycling for the younger samples. So looking to G plates to help us analyze the older samples that were deposited at nearly the same time as grain age formation, we can see that there are two separate locations, one to the north and one to the south. Looking at our potential provenance locations. It seems reasonable that these bottom samples were derived from these provenance locations as this plate is not yet connected to Laurentia according to our model. However, it's harder to, to determine provenance for the source up here as there are many different potential source locations. So using our hafnium isotope data that we've compiled, I was hoping to hopefully refine some of this information. So with the previous example, it's hard to tell exactly what source location these are from. If we have enough hafnium information, we can perhaps characterize those provenance a little bit better. So looking at the exact same age peak with provenance, or <coughs> sorry, the same age peak with the hafnium data involved, I can use my supplementary neodymium isotope system data set and transform those values into epsilon hafnium values based on the work done by Brevoort et al., 1999, which demonstrates a strong correlation between epsilon neodymium and epsilon hafnium. So I just use this equation here. And so plotting that globally, these are all the epsilon hafnium points that I have. It's pretty patchy. It's a pretty small data set. So unfortunately, when I plot the samples that have those grain age peaks, I only get two samples that were crystallized in that age frame and their middle values of epsilon hafnium, which really don't tell us much. It seems that those are a mixture of juvenile crustal sources and rework crustal sources. So we cannot at this point characterize our provenance very good due to the lack of information with the neodymium data set. Moving on to multivariate statistics or analysis. We used correspondence analysis because it was designed for frequency analysis. So we are treating grain ages essentially as frequency counts. We created 20 bins. I have here 20 groups of grain ages for analysis. And we can see here that component 9 represents the grain age peak at 
15, 20 million years, or 1,520 million years, which is representative of the North American magmatic gap. So using k-means clustering, I have clusters plotted that we've created, and I've purposely symbolized cluster four much more distinct than the rest because we believe that cluster four is picking up all of the, gr or the samples that have grain ages that are characteristic of this North American magmatic gap. And so to help support that theory, I just want to show, I've extracted all of my samples that have high probability peak grain ages of that same North American magmatic gap. So I don't have as many samples. There's only a few here because in the previous slide, the clusters are picking up samples that have any, I believe that they have any amount of the uh, crustal or the, <clears throat> of the North American magmatic gap, whereas these samples have high amounts. So if I plot this in G plates, I can see I've got my samples right here. I don't have many sources on Laurentia at all. I have some sources over here and some sources here, but that our model suggests that that's not connected to Laurentia. So instead, if I go back in time to when these grain ages were forming and look at the paleo reconstruction at that time, I can get a better understanding of what's going on. So at 1590, I can see there's quite a bit of an activity on Australia, and our plate model suggests that it's actually connected to the northwest part of Laurentia at this time. So if I slowly step forward through time, I can see that there's quite a bit of activity on Australia, and there really, I mean, there's some on the margin of Laurentia there, but not that much. And then at 1540, we see Australia start to rift apart from, our, from Laurentia and our plate model. So I think that it's more probable, looking at our plate reconstruction, that these grains are being sourced from Australia at this time as compared to on Laurentia. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that plate models are very helpful in this sense because we get a better idea of what's actually going on at the time rather than looking at current plate tectonic locations. And then finally, just a quick note on using cumulative probability to infer geodynamic settings. We can do this based on the paper by Kawood, Hawksworth, and Dehume in Geology 2012. So figure three just shows the workflow process for doing this. And this is a cumulative, cumulative, cumulative probability plot for all my samples. So red represents convergent tectonic settings, blue is collisional, and green is extensional. And plotting these, this essentially helps us quality check our plate tectonic model. So these were actually some of the grains that we were looking at previously where we saw the chunk of landmass accreting up into Laurentia. So this is suggesting that there's a convergent margin there, which when we saw that sample, or when we saw that G plates frame, suggests that that's true. So future work, this project has been primarily limited to visualization of the data at this, at this state with limited multivariate analysis. So in future, I'd like to draw more on multivariate analysis and machine learning techniques to have a better quantitative assessment. And that's everything. <laughs>